Welcome everyone. Just seeing if we're actually working here. Oh yeah, we got a little bit of latency, but that's okay. Looks like we're going. Hello and welcome to another live stream. Today we are talking about medicinal wines. Uh, basically soaking herbs in alcohol and taking your herbs that way. Sorry, let me shut this down real quick. Um, so if you're here live, go ahead and say hello. Let me know if you're here. Uh, if you want to go ahead and type in your real name, I feel weird referring to people by their screen name. So if you want to say hello, where you're watching from, and then um, let me know, have you ever tried this? Have you ever tried soaking Chinese herbs in alcohol and taking your herbs that way? That's something I've done just kind of for fun, but let me know if that's something that you've ever tried. And um, if you're here watching in the replay, same thing. Let me know if you've ever tried this. Uh, basically, the reason this came up is so, uh, somebody emailed me this question. They were listening to the podcast. I have a podcast at podcast.tcmstudy.net. Um, and basically on that podcast, it's we're talking to other practitioners a lot of times about how to start a practice and things that happen with business and things like that. Uh, but usually we start out the podcast, uh, we're drinking during the podcast and having a conversation. So sometimes we drink normal things like uh, bourbon or white Russians or things like that. But a lot of times we start off, I say, I'm drinking an herbal wine. And so somebody emailed me to ask, what, like, what kind of herbal wine are you drinking? Can you say more about that, about how you make herbal wine? So I thought we could uh, do something about that today, talk about taking your herbs with alcohol and see how that works. Cody's here from Baton Rouge. Hi, Cody. Good to see you again. And Davin from, and from New York City. Awesome. Good to see you all. Johan all the way from Sweden. Thanks for being here, guys. Um, so yeah, herbal wines. So I guess maybe we should start out by saying there are several ways that we can take herbs in Chinese medicine. It's several different forms to actually get the herbs inside your body. And so I think the most common way that we do nowadays is decoction. We call that a tong. Basically we take all these sticks, leaves, and twigs and boil them in water for like half an hour, strain it out, and then drink the liquid. Um, so we usually refer to this as a decoction rather than as a tea, because a lot of people, when they think of tea, they think of like celestial seasonings, herbal infusions, like, ooh, I'm drinking a nice, an infusion of ginger. And that's not really what we're doing. Really, we're taking like all these roots, sticks, twigs, leaves, we're boiling them for like half an hour or more, and you get this thick, smelly, kind of not very good tasting liquid afterwards. And it's like, so it's not like drinking tea, it's you're taking medicine. And so, so I think that's why we use the word decoction. The Chinese, you, the Chinese word we use is tang, which literally means soup. So it's like you're cooking a soup out of herbs. And so I think, I, th I feel like this is the easiest, most common way we see herbs being prepared, or at least the traditional way to prepare herbs. And sometimes we have different words for this. Tang, I think, is the one you see the most. But sometimes we have words like um, yin, like sangju yin, uh, mulberry and chrysanthemum drink. Sometimes we have jian, which I think is translated as brew, like iguan jian. And, but those all refer to the same thing. We're putting herbs in water and boiling them. I think just uh, yin, you don't boil it for quite as long, or maybe some of them you coarsely grind the herbs and then boil them for 15 minutes and then strain them. So uh, tang, yin, jian, um, those are all just referred to boiling the herbs in water. Another really common way to take herbs is in pills. We can call that wan or pian. Wan means pill, pian means tablet. I don't think there's a difference between those two except for the shape, that a wan, a pill, tends to be more of a round ball, and a pian is more of an oval tablet shape. And so here, usually what we're doing is we're taking the herbs, we grind them into a powder, and then without cooking the herbs, we mix them with some sort of medium and then form them into a little pill. So the, the medium could be green tea, we take the powdered herbs and mix them with a little bit of green tea and form them into balls, and that's why we call them tea pills. We could take that powder and mix it with honey and form that into little balls, and that's why they're called honey pills. 
Um, so wan is just pill. And this can vary from like little BB size things to more like ping pong ball size things. Sometimes they'll take these herbs uh, after they make this pill, they'll coat it in a wax ball. I made this mistake once where I got like some, some pills and it was a box of things when you opened up, it was like a bunch of little ping pong balls and it was like really hard. And I was like, am I supposed to swallow this whole thing? Like, how does this work? And then somebody was like, no, that's a wax coating. You're supposed to break it open and then eat the thing that's inside. The, the, the round ball thing is really just like a packaging method. And I was like, oh, I'm glad you said something about that before I tried to swallow this big ball of wax. So that's another way is Juan Pien are uh, pills. You also see some uh, formulas traditionally made as powders or san, like xiao yao san, chai hu shu gan san, things like that. And this one is a little bit confusing because I think our traditional powders are very different from uh, modern, what we have is granules. And sometimes granules get referred to as san as well, but that's very different from the traditional powdered herbs. So traditionally, when they said san or powder, they just meant you take the, the raw herbs after they've been dried and you grind them into a really fine powder. If you want to take those internally, usually what you do is you would pour hot water on it and stir it and make it into a draft and then drink that. And that's what we mean by san or powder. So the herbs haven't been cooked. The herbs haven't been extracted in any way. It's just the raw herbs ground up into a powder and you drink it. The modern version, granules, san, is more like the instant coffee of herbal medicine. That's where um, they decocted the herbs and made a, a thick decoction. So they took the herbs and boiled them in water, strained it, and they have that resulting liquid. And then they freeze dry that until it forms a powder. And so that's what, then that's what granules are. So sometimes it's, it's really weird that people will say san is granules, but that's kind of a, a more modern invention. Traditionally, when you said san, we just meant you took the herbs and ground them into a powder. Then you could either apply them externally, or if you take them internally, you usually mix them with water. Oh, Alex is saying, we miss you in San Diego. Uh, Got to be honest, not sure I miss San Diego. Sorry, guys. I mean, gas is like $2 a gallon here. Actually, maybe I shouldn't say that. We just had a blizzard here, so maybe I miss, maybe I was missing San Diego during the blizzard. But it turns out I actually really like shoveling snow. Um, mm, 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 mm. so forms of herbs we have uh, decoction. Decoctions are I feel like decoctions are the most traditional. Decoctions are usually the cheapest because you just bought, you're just buying the raw herbs. Decoctions are the easiest to modify because it's very easy to add and subtract herbs from the formula. The problem is decoctions, I guess we could say patient compliance is the problem with decoctions. Nobody wants to cook them. Sometimes it's like people will be excited about it for the first week. They're like, ooh, it's like Harry Potter. I'm cooking my herbs. I'm cooking my potion and they're drinking it. Um, usually after a week that uh, the novelty wears off and they just don't do it anymore. It turns out like boiling herbs for half an hour is really annoying. It's a long process. It usually smells funny. Um, I've, had, I've had some patients that they say like they'll try to cook their herbs and their family complains about the smell in the house of their herbs. Um, so that's annoying. And then also you have to taste the herb. So you're drinking something and you like have to taste it and that can get old after a while. So those are kind of the downsides of a decoction. Uh, pien pills or wan pills are much easier to take because you're just swallowing a pill. You don't have to taste it. Um, you don't have to prepare it. You just pop the open bottle and take it. So it's a lot easier to take. It's a lot better for patient compliance. Problems are because the herbs aren't cooked, they're not extracted, we don't have a high enough of an absorption rate. So it's like the pills just aren't nearly as effective as cooking a decoction. Also with pills, they can't be modified. So if you're in, like, unless you're making your pill pills yourself and like, who does that? But if you're just buying pre-made pills, you can't modify the formula. And sometimes that's really important that we'll want to take out one herb or add in an extra herb. That's, there's not really a way to do that um, with pills. <clears throat> 
San, the traditional San, I feel like nobody actually does that anymore. Nobody grinds up herbs into a powder and then adds water and drinks them in the tradition in that traditional San way. I think there was just a period in um, in China where they are really into that. And I guess maybe the difference between a decoction and a powder is the word San. Uh, it means powder, but it also means to scatter or to disperse. So a lot of, there was a period in China where it was really popular that if you had a draining formula or a dispersing formula, they would make it as a powder. So that's why like Chai Hu Shugan San, it disperses liver cheese stagnation. Suni San, it disperses liver cheese stagnation. The reason it was a San is because they thought the powder was better for dispersing. But turns out nobody ever does that anymore. So if you're prescribing Xiao Yao San, nobody grinds it into a powder. They just cook it as a decoction or they take it as a pill. Um, granules, if you do use the more modern san, I think it's a little bit more, um, it's more effective than just taking a pill. It's easier than cooking a decoction, but you still have to taste it, so you still have those problems. Uh, I would say granules are also the most expensive. So those are some different forms of taking herbs. I guess I guess maybe another form would be food therapy. There are certain herbs you can cook as as food therapy, but those things tend to be foods anyway, like goji berries or lotus root or things like that. Some things like huang qi you can make into a, a stock and eat that with your soup. But um, usually most herbs you wouldn't want to do with the, this with just because they taste really bad. They're going to ruin your food and make it unappetizing, so it's better just to cook them separately and drink it all at once. But what were we talking about? Really the point here is this was all an introduction into um, herbal wines, medicinal wines, or uh, gyos. Another way of taking your herbs is to soak them in alcohol and then drink the alcohol. And so in Chinese this is called jiu. And if anybody's Chinese, go ahead and correct my pronunciation on that. My understanding is J, uh, J-I-U. There's actually a hidden vowel in there. There's an O in there. So you have to say Jiu, Jiu. But I have heard some people say Jiu. I don't know if that what's correct. Um, so herbs and capsules aren't cooked together. Usually not, or at least traditionally not. Um, basically they would, and it depends on the brand sometimes nowadays, but usually they would just grind the herbs into a powder and then form them into pills. What some uh, modern companies do is they'll do a mixture of powder and granule. So instead of having your granules where you stir it in water and drink it, they'll take some like 50% powdered herbs and 50% granules and they'll put that into a pill or maybe they'll do 100% granules and put that into a pill and so those have actually been cooked first but that's going to depend on your brand when you get like the cheap chinese tea pills like when you get a bottle of baohuan that's like five dollars a bo uh, bottle and it's those little back black pills those have not been cooked that's just they grind it into a powder and then mix it with honey and um, make the pill so I think, but I think some other brands, like I think Blue Poppy, they have one line of pills where they actually mix together powders and granules. So you might have to ask the manufacturer about that. But yeah, it turns out another way we can take our herbs is by soaking the herbs in alcohol, usually for like one month to six months, soaking our herbs in alcohol, and then drinking the resulting alcohol. So why would we want to do this? Well, kind of like with the some of the pills, it just makes it easier that instead of having to cook a decoction every day and smell it and then have to drain it and do all this work and drink your herbs, you could just make a big vat of alcohol and then you're just taking like a shot of alcohol every day. And so it makes so it's like you still have to taste it, you're still drinking it, but it's um, it's not the same amount of work as actually cooking the herbs each time, and it's probably going to be a little bit more effective than um, just taking a pill. So Johan is asking, is herbal wine the same as a tincture? I believe so, but I've had people argue with me about this. So my understanding of the definition of a tincture is just um, something that's been extracted through alcohol. So I would think they're the same thing. 
I would say just don't get confused that sometimes we have modern tinctures that come in a dropper and like you take like five drops of it. That's really not the same as this, as when we say traditional medicinal wines or joes, we're talking about taking a lot of herbs and soaking them in alcohol for a long time and then usually take like a, either a tablespoon or like a shot at a time. Um, so I think, I think that's not quite the same as like when you get like blue poppy tinctures and it's a little dropper bottle and you just take like five drops. I think that, I think it's not quite the same. And sometimes we, ha we can have tinctures that are glycerin based and so we can give them to children since they don't have alcohol and so that's something a little bit separate. This is more like you get a big vat, you put like a, a pound of herbs in there and, so, and soak it in alcohol for one month to six months. And so the downside of this is the prep time, that it takes a long time. Like you, you, have to, you have to think ahead. You can't just be like, I want these herbs tomorrow. You have to like put these together and soak them for at least a month. A lot of people will say like three months or six months. So you have to think ahead. It takes a long time. But the idea is this would be something that you would be taking continuously over a long period of time. So it's like you would prepare this alcohol and then you would pre like prepare a month for six months worth of it. And it's just something that you would take continuously. So usually we would do this with tonifying herbs because we just want to continuously tonify. As you get into old age, you're like, I want to tonify my jing, I want to tonify my chi, tonify my blood. So rather than cooking dong wei every day, I'm going to make an alcohol and just drink the alcohol a little bit. So that's kind of the downside is it takes, you can still, um, you can still customize it in any way that you want, but it just takes a long time. You have to think ahead. It takes a long time to prepare and so you can drink it. And so, like I said, we, the, I think traditionally this was mostly done with tonifying herbs. So tonify chi, tonify blood, tonify yin, tonify yang. Um, those were the easiest, uh, those were the ones you could extract. And it's also, those are the kinds of herbs that you would be taking over a long period of time. You, it's, I think it's a little bit more unusual to say like, I'm going to make a medicinal wine that releases the exterior. People don't do it that way. That way you would just get some herbs and cook them for 10 minutes and drink the tea. You wouldn't bother making a medicinal wine for, in case you got sick. So what kind of, so I guess that the other question here was like, what kind of herbs are we using with this? Like I said, tonifying herbs, what kind of recipes do we have? So basically with mine, I usually just took a bunch of tonifying herbs and threw them together. But um, if we want to, we could look at, oh, you messed up my screen. Move me over there. If we go on the internet, I can type in TCM spring wine and see what comes up. Because, it, because this is one, I think, category of uh, medicinal wines that people would take a lot. They call them spring wines and they're basically tonics. They're usually kidney yang tonics because again, that's who would want to take these formulas are basically older men who are worried about being able to get it up or just um, aging gracefully. And as their post heaven essence wanes, they want to um, sort of tonify chi blood and essence. So we can, um, so spring wine is one thing. We can just look it up. And I think some people sell these pre-made kits that you can uh, soak in alcohol, but we can look and see what kind of things are here. Um, so here we have things like Lurong deer antler. Is it not gonna, it's not gonna let me highlight. Here we have things like Lurong deer antler, Lu Jiao Jiao, which is just gelatin made out of deer antler. Zhe Chu. Zhe Chu is human placenta. I'm not sure where they're getting their Zhe Chu. Who is this plum dragon? I'm not sure where Z, uh, plum dragon is getting their Zhe Chu. Um, but that's placenta. So I think sometimes they use animal placenta, but really it's it should be human placenta because it tonifies everything. Um, But then we have other things like uh, Dong Wei, Tonify Blood, uh, Gochitsa, Tonify Blood, Tonify Essence, good for the eyes. 
And so those are some examples of things you could soak in alcohol. Let's see what else we have. Uh, that was General Lee's Wine of Life. And so a lot of people made um, have these things, and they're kind of variations of the same thing. So here this is Spring Wine. Here, we, again, Lurong Lu Jiao Jiao E Jiao, Donkey Antler, or Donkey uh, Gelatin. Gui Ban Jiao, gelatin made out of a uh, tortoise shell. So here you can see we're using a lot of animal parts, and that's very common in uh, these tonics for medicinal wines that uh, and so, like some of these animal parts you don't really cook. Like if you had a deer antler and you boiled it in water, people would look at you funny. Chinese people would be like, you're wasting your deer antler. Uh, a lot of these animal parts, the way we use them is by soaking them in alcohol and we get a better extraction through the alcohol rather than by boiling them. Uh, Yin Yang Huo is here. Yin Yang Huo is horny goat weed. Uh, this one is kind of interesting because it's a leaf. So I, I remember one time I made a, a big vat of alcoholic herbs and I put yin yang huo in there and I told my Chinese teacher about it and he was like, no, don't use yin yang huo. Yin yang huo is a leaf. You don't put a leaf in alcohol. I was like, why not? I have this recipe that says add yin yang huo. Yin yang huo is a, it's horny goat weed. It's a yang tonic. Why not? And he was like, you know, it looks funny. It's kind of like, you know, when the leaves fall in the street and then they go in the and then they go in the gutter and they get wet and they start decomposing and it looks really bad. That's kind of like yin yang huo. It just looks bad. And I thought that was really funny that that's one of the things you should take into consideration when making uh, medicinal wines apparently is does it look pretty? Xu Di Huang, Romania, Huang Qi, Astragalus, Du Zhong, Eucomia Cortex, or the Tree of the Rubber Bark. So again, here we're having uh, tonify blood, tonify essence, tonify qi, tonify yang, again, dangwe and gochitsa to tonify blood, uh, nujenza is tonic, suo yang, locking yang, again, we have zhe chu, I'm not sure where they're getting their zhe chu. Uh, hongshen is red ginseng, dangshen, I think that's kind of weird that they have both red ginseng and dangshen, usually you'd use one or the other. Uh, fupenza is the, the raspberry, the Chinese raspberry. Um, which is also a yang tonic. Hai long, uh, hai means sea, long means dragon. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah, I guess sea horses and sea dragons are two different things, but we tend to use both of those. Again, we're soaking animal parts in alcohol. And like kushu, gu jie is another very common one. Gu jie geckos, so tonify, um, tonify yang, tonify essence. Usually use a pair of geckos, one male and one female. So th these are some examples that if you just want to look up. I'm not sure if this one will have a list of herbs. Here we talk about the properties of alcohol. Snake wine, so that's another one. You can uh, take snakes like bai hua shu white flower snake and soak in alcohol. So again, animal parts we tend to soak in alcohol. Um, this is interesting, rose petals. Uh, I think even um, Mayway had an article where they had a couple recipes uh, making Chinese uh, herbal tonic wine. So if you, on the May, May Way is a distributive herbs, the herbs are really good. I really like the herbs there. Um, sulfur free, it's just a lot of times they're out of stock of the things that I want. Um, so here they have some more simple ones and these, these ingredients are gonna be a lot cheaper. So you have Renshen, Gochitsa, Shu Di Huang, rock sugar. So we're just tonifying qi, tonifying blood and so um, that's the thing about a lot of those animal parts, Lu Rong, Lu Jiao Jiao, Gui Ban, Gui Ban Jiao, Gu Jie, those are all really expensive. Whereas if you do like 20 grams of Ren Shen and 25 grams of Shu Di Huang, that's not going to be very expensive at all. Uh, here they just did Sejun Zetong um, in alcohol, Su Wu Tong in alcohol, five seeds, so uh, uh, Fu Penza, Tu Sitsu. Uh, a, a lot of kidney tonic. So those are some examples of, can I go back? Well, let me go back. Oh, camera. So those are some examples of medicinal wines.
Um, can you legally sell herbal wines from a practice? I don't know. I would guess not because it's like you're selling alcohol. So I think you would need like a liquor license to do it. I feel like some people might do it and just they don't, their volume isn't high enough that they don't get in trouble. And so, but I think another option is like, like the, what these websites were doing is they weren't selling the alcohol, they were just selling the herbs. So you could say, here's a packet of herbs, uh, go home and get some alcohol and soak them for a month and then you'll have your own medicinal wine. So you could certainly sell the herbs. I think selling the alcohol might get you into trouble. But that just means that um, they have to wait a month before we before you um, before you can start drinking it. Oh, uh, another another place we can go if my if my screen still works. My screen still works. I always like it when that works. Is if you go uh, there's a book by Bob Flaws, Chinese medicinal wines and elixirs. So this is Chinese medicinal wines and elixirs. And the author is Bob Flaws. And so this is a book where he just outlines different recipes for different medicinal wines and elixirs. And so uh, this is a cool thing when you're, if you're shopping on Amazon, go and look at this look inside. And it will give you a, a preview. It'll kind of give you the table of contents in the first couple pages. So I think this one doesn't give you any um, actual recipes in the preview, but you can kind of read the introduction. So um different types of wines um i was gonna say here he has a thing on uh categories of yao jiu so yao means herb so chinese herbs is zhong yao and uh, jiu means alcohol so this is herbal alcohol and so why would we want to make herbal alcohol well you could uh basically to tonify tonify qi blood yin and yang strengthening the sinews and bones. So this is another one, especially as people get older, they have arthritis or B syndrome. So this is a, this is another common one. Um, we kind of don't like to say this, but there's actually a very traditional jiu called hugu mugwa jiu. Uh, hugu is tiger bone, mugwa is quince fruit. And so it's basically, they would take tiger bones and soak them in alcohol and that would strengthen your bones. And so especially if you were, you were getting old and you had weak low back or you had a lot of um, uh, arthritis conditions, you could use tiger bone. That's, that's how they traditionally use tiger bone was they'd soak it in alcohol and it's for um, strengthening the sinews and bones, dispelling wind here. Again, we're talking about wind damp B or rheumatic arthritis. So when you say dispelling wind, we're talking about arthritis and B syndrome. So I feel like this kind of goes in the category of um, strengthening sinews and bones. We're not talking about uh, you have fever and chills and you got sick. We're talking about arthritis. Clearing heat and disinhibiting dampness. This is kind of interesting because usually we think of uh, alcohol as being heat generating and being damp generating. So that would be kind of interesting to see what kind of um, herbs he use in, uses in those. Tonifying the spleen and harmonizing the stomach. Gynecological conditions, uh, especially uh, postpartum things. So again, when we want to tonify a lot, tonify chi, tonify blood. Oh, here, external invasion to treat the common cold. So I guess we do have uh, traditional recipes to do that. So that's maybe something to, to keep on hand. Warding off scourges. Uh, this is pestilential chi or epidemics. So basically warding off uh, when you have a, a febrile epidemic sweeping the countryside, that's something I could use. Uh, traumatic injury, I would, um, because again, alcohol is really good at breaking up chi and blood stasis. Uh, I feel like most of this is, would be applied externally, but maybe you could take it internally as well. So that's, a, so that's another thing you could look at is um, Bob Flaw's Chinese Medicinal Wines and Elixirs. I'll put a link in the description below. So that, that's another place if you're interested in making wines, uh, herbal wines, that's another thing to look at. Um, um, that was an interesting question. How do I get back to my, come on, there we go. There I am, there. Um, what do you think about the soaking them in dirt theory? I've never done that. I've kind of wanted to do that. 
because I, th- I think there were some recipes where it would it would it was like a combination of the two it would say like um you get a you get a big vat you soak these herbs in alcohol and then you bury it in the ground for a month and this was especially for spleen tonic so it was like this very this this very straightforward doctrine of signatures that the spleen belongs to the earth element and so if you want to enhance that you can bury your herbs in the dirt in order to enhance its spleen tonifying property so i I've, I've never done that and that doesn't sound like a real thing to me but i think it would be fun to try it's like if you're the kind of person who likes to dance naked on the full moon or you like to charge your crystals with full moon energy i feel like this is the same way this is kind of the same kind of concept where it's like we're burying our herbs in the earth to give it more earth. Yeah, so this is what we're going to get into next. This is a good one. What's the best liquor to use to get the best efficacy? Basically, the short answer is the strongest thing you can find. Oh, but that's what I was going to say about... Um, this book, Chinese uh, Medicinal Wines and Elixirs... One of the points that Bob Flaws makes in his introduction in this book is that we're not just taking formulas and soaking them in alcohol. It doesn't really work that way because we have to think about the alcohol is now an ingredient in the formula. So we have to take into account the properties of the alcohol and how that's going to interact with the rest of the herbs. So it's not like we would just take Xiao Yao San and put it in alcohol. Um... So that's one of the things he talks about is the properties of the alcohol and um, how, how it will affect the, the actions of the formula. Because remember, alcohol is it's, um, it's very invigorating. So it invigorates blood. It's very moving. It has an upward action that it sends things up to the face. So this is something that we even see in formulas, that we have things like Gualo Shei Bai Bai Jiu Tong, which you add in some alcohol and that brings the formula up to the face, or the Wang Qing Ren formula that goes to the te- head, um, Tong Chao Huo Shui Tong. When we have blood stagnation in the head, we have a bunch of blood invigorating herbs, but then we add in some alcohol and that guides the formula upward to the head. So alcohol has this upward guiding action. So we have to take that into account. Um, I think we also said that alcohol has a strong action as part of invigorating blood and directing things to the liver. It also is good for stopping pain. And so that's why we'll use a lot of, um, you'll see medicinal wines used for B syndrome very commonly. But as far as uh, best type of alcohol to use, uh, something that I like to point out sometimes and I think this was even mentioned in that Bob Flaws book here. Let's see if we can go back and, and find that page. If we look inside. Types of wine. So we have Huangzhou, yellow wine, which is wine made out of rice or millet. This is similar to sake, so it's usually about 15%. Grape wine. Uh, and Baijiu, white wine, is distilled alcohol. And so here he talks about the different types of uh um, alcohols that are traditionally used. But I think the point here, the, I guess one of the points I want to make, one of the things to look out for is this term jiu means alcohol or spirit or basically, basically any type of alcohol. It often gets translated as wine. And when Westerners see the word wine, they typically think of grape wine. And that is not what we're talking about. And so it, it's especially bad that when people see the word baijiu, it gets translated as white wine. So when you have like gualo xie bai baijiu tong, it says add in a small amount of white wine. There, People are like, oh, should I use some Chardonnay or some Sauvignon Blanc? And it's like, no, that's not what we mean. In Chinese, we could basically say there are two categories of wine. We have huangjiu, yellow wine, and that's distilled wine, uh, usually rice or millet. And basically, when you dis, or that's um, fermented wine. Sorry, not distilled. That's fermented wine, usually rice or millet. And basically, when you ferment things, you can only get up to like 15%, and then you get to a point where the alcohol will actually kill the yeast. So if you're just making a fermented wine or a fermented alcohol, you can only get up to like 10, 15%, and that's what we mean by Huangzhou. 
Baijiu means distilled wine. So after we ferment it and get it up to 15%, we put it in a still, and then we can raise the percentage to like 40%, 50%. And so that's what we mean by Baijiu. So long story short, if you're ever reading a book or reading a formula and it says add Baijiu or add white wine, we don't mean add Sauvignon Blanc, we mean add some vodka. And so that's, I think, the easiest one to use is basically we want something strong enough. You're going to be soaking this for like um, one month to six months. And so you want something strong enough that it will kill anything that will want to grow in it. If you just use like a regular, a low percentage alcohol, the herbs could still get moldy or things could grow and it won't extract very well. You want to use something like that's 40 or 50 percent. And usually we would use vodka. Also, when I asked my Chinese teacher about this, uh, somebody asked him what type of alcohol sh should you use. He just said, yeah, use vodka because we want something really strong. It's clear. Then he also said, don't bother getting good alcohol. Don't get expensive vodka. Just get the cheapest vodka you can. Because after the herbs have been soaking for like a month or two months, you're not going to be able to taste the alcohol. It's just going to taste like Chinese herbs. So don't bother getting good alcohol or alcohol that tastes good. Just get the cheapest alcohol because you're trying to extract the herbs. And I thought that was kind of another funny thing. Um, so usually so usually vodka. Um, I was going to say I, I had some friends in Kentucky who would experiment with different things and they would try to say that different alcohols have different yin and yang properties. Um, so they were like, uh, I feel like something like Angel's Envy is a little bit more smoother and more sweeter, but if you had something like Bullet Bourbon has more rye in it, and so it's a little bit spicy and it's a little bit more yang. So when they wanted to make yang tonics, they would choose a bourbon or a rye that was a little bit warmer and spicier. And then how much do you drink? I think people usually drink like a shot or a tablespoon. I always thought just drink a shot and then some people were like, no, that's way too much. Let's see what Mayway says. Does Mayway have uh, a recommendation? Here. Uh, so here Mayway is saying in their, in their recipes, let's make uh, herbal tonic wines. Go away, quality assistant. Let's make herbal tonic wines. Here they're saying Take one small shot or one ounce, two tablespoons in the evenings. And so that's that's why I think traditionally we would, that's what we would do. A shot, which is like two tablespoons. And so that's why I think this is different than a lot of times when you get tinctures in the bottles with the droppers. You're just taking a couple drops. But when you make it this way, you're like taking a shot at a time. What else was I going to say? Any other questions about herbal wine? So yeah, I think usually what I've done with mine, um, I basically, uh, I got like a two gallon vat, just put in a bunch of herbs. I probably put in way too many herbs just because I would buy herbs by the pound. So I just dump in a whole bunch. I think you don't really need to use that much. So maybe follow a recipe that you find online and then just um, pour in cheap vodka and then let it soak. Uh, I think usually you're, you should let it soak at least a month. I've heard some people say three months and six months. And then sometimes what you can do is, um, what I've heard some people say is like, let it soak for three months and then take out, like pour out half of it and put that in bottles and that's ready to drink and then refill it with more alcohol and let it soak for another three months. And some people say you can actually do that several times. Like if you get some really good high quality ginseng that's really expensive you can put it in a bottle um, let it soak pour out half of it and then refill it and then pour out half of it and then refill it and that way you can like you can still uh, extract more um, herbs and um, so it's, it's kind of like with sometimes when people make a decoction they strain they strain the herbs and then cook cook the herbs again like you can decoct the herbs twice it's like you can do the same thing with alcohol and it's kind of like an everlasting gobstopper if you just like keep refilling it and drinking it and refilling it. As long as you don't let it get too low, you can you can keep refilling it. Do you store it in a dark room? I do. 
but that's just because I put it in a closet to have it be out of the way. I'm not sure that it's necessary. Um, because this is sometimes, sometimes when you go to uh, um, herb shops in China, um, pharmacy was the word I'm looking for. If you go to a, a, an herbal pharmacy in China, sometimes they'll have things on display and they'll have like a big deer antler, a big lurong in alcohol. And they'll say, oh, this lurong has been in my family for five generations and it's really expensive or they have some really beautiful ginseng and they'll soak it on alcohol and put it on display and say, this is our top quality ginseng. So I think that you don't necessarily have to. Um, I think I heard a story from one guy that he was a, a physical therapist or a physical trainer or a personal trainer, and he made a big vat of things, uh, a dit de jiao, so alcohol, herbs and alcohol, but for external application. And the idea was it's like you have to you have to shake it every once in a while. And so what he would do is anytime one of his clients came in, they would have to pick up this five-gallon vat of dit de jiao and shake it around a few times and then put it back down. And that was like part of their exercise. So I think that, at least for him, he probably wasn't keeping it in a dark room. So I think you don't have to. I think the reason you keep things in the dark room is to prevent things from growing in them. And I think that the alcohol might be strong enough that it's not like gonna grow algae. That's why if you use if you use a strong alcohol, it's not gonna grow things in it. So I don't think you have to. But then it's like you have a you have a jar of herbs sitting out, so just put it in a closet. So what did we say? We talked about types of herbs. Um I feel like the most common one is tonic herbs or herbs for bee syndrome, which at that point are also tonic herbs. And one of our ways of treating bee syndrome is tonified liver and kidney yin to strengthen tendon and bone. And so that's what we're going to, that's usually what we're going to treat, uh, how we're going to treat bee syndrome. Uh, types of alcohol. Again, um, you can use different types. Usually you want something strong, and that's something, if you look in that Bob Flaws book, sometimes different um, different recipes will use different types of alcohol, but they're usually like the traditional Chinese type, so like a millet wine or a rice wine or sometimes a grape wine or something like that with different strengths, but um, you, you can use different types. Sometimes different recipes will call for different types based on their properties, but the easiest thing is just go get cheap vodka. Trying to think there's anything else. I meant to make a list of things, a list of bullet points, but I forgot. It's been a rough week. Could you use vinegar? I've never heard of that. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Because sometimes when you talk about powder, about preparing herbs, sometimes we prepare herbs with alcohol. Like, in, like instead of like jirgan sao, we stir fry them in honey. Sometimes we have like a jiu chao chuan chong where you soak an herb in alcohol and then stir fry it. Or you do that with dong wei. They talk about like wine wash dong wei. We can do the same thing with vinegar. Like with um, yan hu suo, you have zu chao yan hu suo. Zu means vinegar. And so this is another way to prepare herbs that and it's very similar to alcohol, that alcohol goes to the liver, and so alcohol has an invigorating property. Alcohol has the ability to stop pain. Uh, vinegar is very similar because it's sour in flavor. It goes to the liver. It has a very, it can um, invigorate blood. It can stop pain. It also has an astringent action. So I've heard of preparing herbs in vinegar that way, like the tzu chao yan hu suo. You just take some yan hu suo, soak it in vinegar, and stir fry it. I mean, you would you would let you wouldn't necessarily have to do that yourself. You could let the manufacturer do it. I'm not I'm not sure I've heard of using the actual vinegar. Um, and I'm trying to think of like would that actually taste good? I'm I'm not sure I'd want to drink a shot of vinegar because uh, the vinegar would taste gross. And I'm not sure I'd want to put the vinegar on anything because I feel like any of the herbs are going to make the vinegar taste gross. I mean, it's one thing if you, like, put some garlic and red peppers in vinegar, but I feel like if you put dong wei in vinegar, like, who wants to eat dong wei flavored vinegar? So, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I'll have to ask someone. Uh... 
And again, this is something that you would usually, you would probably take on a long-term basic if you wanted to, um, basically if you want to take tonifying herbs over a long period of time. Usually this would be for like chronic conditions in elderly patients. I think that's another thing. I don't know if it's in the Bob Flaws book or in a different book where you talk about um, sometimes young people are really into like taking these tonics. They're like, oh, I'm going to strengthen my chi. I'm going to tonify my essence and be strong and immortal. And really it's like if you're in your 20s, you shouldn't be doing that. Like if you're younger, it's more about making sure your chi is flowing harmoniously. So you don't need to add things. You just, you actually need more movement rather than tonifying. So that's why we say like these spring wines or spring elixirs, it's usually people in their 50s or in their 60s that are just trying to gently tonify things over time. So I feel like that's who usually takes these. Um, but I guess I just did it for fun. And the thing is, I think like I never did it on a regular basis either, so I don't know how it works. Usually like I would get really excited and I'd make a vat of these and then I'd like forget about it for a long time. So I've actually like moved several times and I took my vats of alcohol with me. So like I have this one that like I'm pretty sure I made it in Kentucky. And so like I've moved twice since then. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it's several years old just because I forgot about it and I'm not very good at taking my herbs regularly. Um, so now I've just been drinking it. Yeah, and I, uh, sorry, uh, um, I'm asking, tonics can cause stagnation. Does the alcohol help prevent it? Yes, and that, and that, I think that's one of the reasons why we're, we're taking it. So especially, um, for one thing, we can talk about tonics creating middle jowl stagnation, and so that's why certain formulas we combine with uh, moving herbs like Chen Pi, um, Sha Ren, Mu Xiang, things like that to prevent middle jowl stagnation. But there's also this idea of it can be more systemic stagnation. So especially when we're tonifying blood, a lot of our formulas that tonify blood also have blood invigorators added to them. So when we look at something like Si Wu Tong, our basic blood tonifying formula, we have Shu Di to tonify blood, Bai Shao to tonify blood, Dong Wei tonifies blood and invigorates blood. And then we add in Chuan Shang, which just invigorates blood. So the idea is if you just tonify blood, it's just gonna sit there and get stuck. So we have to add in some moving herbs to make sure that doesn't happen to, so you can tonify without creating stagnation. And so that's one of the properties of alcohol. Like, well, like in Western medicine, we say alcohol is a blood thinner and will help with cardiovascular disease. Say the same thing in Chinese medicine, that alcohol invigorates blood. And so that's one of the reasons it's there. And that's one of the things that uh, Bob Flaws talks about in his book, too. If we go back to this book, um, Medicinal Wines and Elixirs, that's one of the things he talks about is uh, the properties of alcohol and how we're not just thinking of alcohol as a medium, we're thinking of alcohol as an ingredient in the formula. So that's one of the things we can do. Does he say anything else in here? I'm not sure if we can look at this in the, in the, in the, free, the free introduction types of Chinese wines. Yeah, here you say medicinal wines are mostly used during the winter months and also by older patients. Just because we're, we tend to use a lot of yang tonics, the alcohol itself is warming. And so when we looked at those recipes, it was a lot of lu rong, lu jiao jiao, hong ren shen, red ginseng, ge jie, a lot of yang tonics. So it's going to be a very warming thing. So like, don't take a bunch of yang herbs in the middle of the summer. This is more like, I'm old, it's winter, my joints are getting achy because I hate the cold, I'm going to take some some medicinal alcohol to help with that. And then here, here we're saying that um, warms the center while at the same time raises the clear yang, it has an upward direction, and also quickens the blood. So it's a blood invigorator. Uh, quickening the blood is one, we basically when we talk about invigorating blood, we have three levels of invigorating blood. Quickening the blood is a level of invigorating the blood. Different types of alcohol. Oh, TCM description. Alcohol is bitter, sweet, and acrid in flavor. It's warm in nature and is also toxic. 
in terms of the channel of the heart, liver, lungs, and stomach. In terms of medicinal functions, alcohol opens the blood vessels, wards off cold chi, arouses the spleen, warms the center, and moves. Oh, and moves the, pow the power of medicinals. So it creates movement for the other herbs or directs herbs where to go. Alcohol is also upbearing and outwardly, outwardly dispersing. So that's why when you drink alcohol, you get red in the face. Um, sometimes you get like warm and sweaty because the alcohol is moving up and outward. That's basically, that's the direction of the liver. When you talk about liver is associated with the wood element. Think when we say wood, we mean a tree. A tree grows upward and spreads its branches outward. So that's the direction of the liver. We have liver yang goes upward and branches outward. And again, we use this property when we prepare certain herbs in alcohol or, or in certain formulas. Like when we talked about uh, gualo shei bai bai jiotong, we add alcohol to guide the herb upward with the formulas like tong chao huo shui tong, that's a blood invigorating formula, but it's for the head, so we use alcohol to guide the herbs upward to the head. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty interesting. So maybe just, uh, I put a link down below uh, maybe just go there and then uh, click on this book and then click on the look inside and it looks like you can read the first 10 or so pages of this book and so it kind of goes over those things so that's pretty interesting. And then if you want to uh, make your own maybe uh, go to the Mayway website and they have a few simple cheap recipes or you can google um, TCM spring wine and you can look at um, some of these recipes. Or here, this one over here. Here we had General Lee's, uh, and then we have General Yang Sun's spring wine. So apparently, different generals created their own created their own formulas. So here you can go down and look at the ingredients. Uh, Angelica is Donggui, Cortex Cortex Yumacomia is uh, Dujong. Lyceum, they probably mean Gochitsa. Astragalus is Huang Qi. Deer Horn is Lu Jiao, uh, Lu Rong, or we could use Lu Jiao Jiao or both. <sighs> Glossy privet food. I can't think of what that is. I know what that is. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It might be Fu Penza. I don't think it's Fu Penza. Korean ginseng. Uh, yang lock stem. That's a suo yang. Suo yang literally means locking yang, so it's in the yang tanafa category. Romania is shudi huang, and epimedia is uh, yin yang huo horny goat, goat weed. So those are some. So basically, if you just Google this, you can find some options for spring wine if you wanted to make your own. So Chance is talking about if a coffee siphon could be used to brew herbs. I don't know, yeah, because one thing I would worry about... Okay, I can still hear it in the background. I think they're testing the other buildings, but I think we stopped. Uh, yeah, I got an email about that. They were like, oh, we're testing the fire alarm sometime today. They were supposed to, use it. They were supposed to do it yesterday. Sorry about that. Coffee siphon. I guess I'm not entirely sure what a coffee siphon is as opposed to like a percolator or a drip thing. 
Uh, I guess the thing I would worry about is it depends on the type of herbs. That some herbs that we just, we really want to cook them for a long time. So especially if we're doing like tonifying herbs, we want to cook them for like half an hour or an hour. That It takes that long to extract uh, the medicinal properties. I think if you're looking at other things that are more like leafy things, um, then maybe something like that would work. Because we do have certain, certain herbs that we don't really cook them all that much. We only cook them five or ten minutes, or there are certain things that will even just make them as an infusion. Thinking like lienza sheen, you can just make it as an infusion, um, where you just soak it in uh, soak it in hot water like a tea, or um, the grass that geese don't eat, ubu uh, some of the um, some of the some of the more leafy ones you might be able to get away with if you're doing a tonifying formula or using like ginseng or shu di huang or any of these like thick roots i would say that's probably like the temperature is not enough and it has to steep for a long time um, you want to would want to cook it for an hour um, so i'd say if you're going to do that maybe something leafier and then then really break up um, the herbs first so like not necessarily into a fine powder, but like coarsely break them up, and then you may maybe uh, you would be able to get away with that. Um, okay, it's full immersion, so it's kind of like one of those. Um, I can't think of the French term for when you when you cook things. Um, possibly. And, and actually, actually, if you, if you can go for as long as you want, like sometimes with, um, like with really high quality ginseng, they would say cook it in a double boiler, and they would say don't let, it, don't let the actual water um, boil. And so, uh, like with, so like with ginseng, sous vide, thank you, sous vide was the thing I was looking for. You're like, make a steak with your sous vide. Um, so yeah, with some of those tonic herbs, they would say put them in a double boiler and uh, so you get a nice slow heat and leave it there for hours. So if that's possible, you might be able to do that with some of like your ginseng and some of your tonics like that. Um, I'm just, I'm, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's a possibility. Oh, oh announcements. So anyway, the, the, the point of this was, does my button not work? The point of this was I have a podcast where I drink alcohol and talk to people on a podcast. So go check out the podcast. It's been a little bit more intermittent. For a while I was doing once a week and now I've kind of dropped every, once every other week. It kind of depends on whether or not I can get people to actually do it. It's been... Um, sometimes it's difficult to get people to come on and, and, and actually do it. A lot of people are like, like, oh, that sounds really cool. But then actually scheduling something becomes difficult. Also, let's be honest, I've just been really lazy the last couple of weeks. Um, but there's a, but you can go listen to the podcast. Um, tomorrow I'm doing, um, I want to do some formula reviews. So I'm going to do that same thing here live on YouTube. It's going to be tomorrow at 11 a.m., we're going to start going through formulas. Basically, the idea here is I have a course on Teachable that's a single herbs course. I want to make a formula review course. And so first, what we're going to do, like the rough draft of that course. And so it's going to be a webinar in three parts. We're just going to talk about formulas. The first one is formulas that release the exterior through like downward draining formulas and formulas that harmonize. So like the first third of the formulas, then a week from now we'll do the second third of the formulas, and then a week after that we'll do the third third of formulas. And so if you're interested in that, there's a there's a link down below that it's just going to be um, live on YouTube. And um, it's it's free. Like, I put a link there. Like Some people like to donate. If you want to donate, you can like give five or ten bucks to attend it. Um, but if you don't, if you don't want to, that's fine. Just come to the YouTube live, and so I'll have those up. And basically, I'm going to try to go through all of those and see how it goes. And then in the next couple of weeks, I'll probably re-record those and make it an actual course. 
uh, review course, just kind of like the single herbs course is on Teachable for $40. We'll probably do a formula review course for $40. So that's coming up tomorrow. If you want to look at that, um, check out the podcast. As always, thank you to the Patreon members. I was going to say, see if this button still works. Uh, if you want to join the Patreon, you started trying to make a, a community website where it's kind of like a private Facebook group. So if you want to, if you're a Patreon member, you can join this and you can go on and um, ask questions. Uh oh, I have one. I have one notification. Oh, that's just somebody liked my post. So if uh, this is something that you'll have access to if you join the Patreon, you can go to this uh, this community website and. People ask questions, and we can answer them. Sometimes I do video answers. And so uh, for a while, people were asking me about tutoring, that if I did tutoring, I don't really like doing tutoring. I tried to do tutoring for a while. I think I'm no longer going to do tutoring. Um, So this is a way that if you have specific questions that you want to ask, you can, if you're a Patreon member, you can go there and ask those questions, and I'll... um, I'll give you a response there. So I'd rather, so instead of trying to like set up tutoring sessions once a week, I'm just going to be like, go to that website, ask questions. I'll give you an answer. I'll either type out an answer or just record a short video for the answer. And we'll do it that way rather than trying to do um, tutoring sessions once a week. So that's another option. I think that's it. Let me know if there's any other questions before we go. It's been about an hour. I need to go to the gym. I need to finish my slides for uh, the thing for next time. So um, here, maybe we can pull those up real quick. That's going to be in pages. So uh, for the thing tomorrow, so if you come on tomorrow, Does that button work? No, it's that button. I never get my buttons right. Oh. Do, 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 current application. There. Um, So we have a little, uh, don't do that. Have a little handout. So basically, this is something that uh, I'll have all of a link to download this. If you want to come to the the review class tomorrow, we have basically a a handout with um, all the formulas. So we're going to be going starting with formulas that release the exterior, up through yeah formulas that harmonize, formulas that treat abscesses and sores. I think that really belongs with the heat toxicity category. So we're basically going up through uh, formulas that harmonize, formulas that harmonize the liver and spleen. So um, I'm still I'm still making some final edits on this page, so that'll be up uh, tomorrow. If you go to that live webinar tomorrow, you'll be able to download that. And then I also have some uh, slides. So if you prefer um, looking at the slides. I also have it in a, like a slide form that I'll have those to download. So I, mean, I need to keep working on those today. We'll get that finished up and that'll, that's what we're doing tomorrow is going over those formulas. All right, I think that's it. I'm gonna go to the gym if it's, if the, if it's not on fire. And uh, we'll see you next, we'll, um, again, that thing tomorrow, uh, formula review tomorrow is at 11 a.m. instead of 10 a.m., so it's a little bit later, so 11 a.m. Pacific California time, that'll be noon mountain time, it'll be something else, eastern time. Uh, so you can come to that and then we'll try to do, I'll try to keep doing the live stream next week. I think I, I... it's been a rough couple weeks. I've been real tired and lazy those last couple weeks, so I missed last week, but we'll try to do a live stream uh, next time just in case. Take a fire extinguisher. I might just run the other direction. <sighs> so earlier uh, earlier this year, uh, 
I mean, a, a, a couple weeks ago, we like had a, a blizzard where we got 15 inches of snow. So that was exciting. But the, the temperature was still relatively warm. But like a month before that, it wasn't, there wasn't necessarily a lot of snow, but it got down like below zero degrees Fahrenheit. So like negative 10, negative 15 centigrade. So it was really cold outside. And apparently the coldness, it's, it's usually doesn't get that cold here, but the coldness caused some of the pipes to freeze. And that somehow, and then they unfroze and they burst, and then that somehow shorted out the the fire alarm system. Anyway, so this one time about a month ago, our fire alarm went off at one in the morning when it was three degrees outside. So we had to go outside and wait for the the fire department to get here while it was three degrees. So at least today it's like fifty degrees outside, so it's not too bad. Anyway, that's totally irrelevant. Uh, come check out the thing tomorrow at 11. There's a link in the description below. The, the, the link has a thing that if you want to donate, but um, if you don't want to donate, just click on the link that says, I don't want to donate, and that will take you directly to the YouTube page. And once you go to that YouTube page, you can set a reminder. It will tell you the time in your local time zone. So you can go there and set a reminder. And if you're not interested in formulas, uh, come back next week, and we'll talk about something next week. Uh, go ahead and put some questions in the comments below and we can talk about those next week, but we'll try to do next Friday at the same time. That's it. We'll see you next time.